Hey everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for joining in this evening. Uh, today, if you aren't aware, we're going to be talking about backgrounds and foregrounds. Um, definitely something that I think uh, a lot of people often overlook, and it's definitely something that, for me personally, took years to really start paying attention to. Um, you know, the first few, probably the first five, six, seven years of me doing wildlife photography, uh, all I was paying attention to was the, you know, the subject in front of me, usually a bird. And uh, it was just all about photograph that bird, photograph that bird. And, um, you know, every once in a while I'd get lucky and get a really nice background, nice foreground. Um, but very often I wasn't really paying attention to that. And when I did really start paying attention to that um, is when I noticed my photography becoming a lot more consistent, a lot more pleasing to look at. And, uh, you know, it's something that you definitely have to consciously be aware of, I, I would say, and kind of really train yourself to always look to that. And there's still certainly times, even now, where I'm photographing something and there's maybe a lot of action or something really fun happening. And I, you know, I kind of revert and just pay attention to the subject and, and kind of forget about what's going on in the background and foreground. And, uh, you know, if you can always pay attention to that, I think it's a helpful thing. So today, uh, Scott Keys joins me. Say hey there. Hey, Scott. guys. Hey. And um, I think let's get right into it here. So. Uh, Scott, I think I'm going to kind of hand it off to you. I know you had a little bit of um, something you wanted to talk about with, uh, I know you have a concept that you've you've told me before, um, which is seeing through the subject, and I think it's a really great idea. So I'm going to uh, pop it over to your screen and let you talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, so we broke the, the topics up. We're going to go through some perched birds. We're going to talk about um, the difference between when something's up in the air, like a bird in flight versus something on the ground or water birds. Um, so we're going to go through some perch birds first and just talk about that. So, but the concept that Ray's talking about, which is seeing through the bird, is is really essential. And I actually wanted to kick this off with an example. So, like Ray was saying, the first couple of years we were doing this, um, it was all about the subject. We were just, for me especially, I was just I was consumed with birds. I wanted to find out as much as I could. And anytime I saw something, I would just point the camera and shoot. And then as I got to um, get better and better, I started looking at other facets of the of the work and at one point I thought I was pretty good so I'm going to share an example of something and this is not an example of something I actually like so I'm going to pop this over um, this we were shooting at at Heinz and uh, we were there with a really great photographer Christian and he had called us and said hey like guys you got to come over here it, there's a there's a, a beautiful hawk a golden hour perfect light and I am just lighting this thing up hundreds of frames I'm just loving this hawk I noticed Ray start to like wander off to the side and kind of leave me. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm not moving. As I'm I not, often do. I'm not, yeah, I, I am going to hit this thing because I'm afraid it's going to it's going to fly at any second. So I get this shot and I get home and I look at hundreds of frames of stuff I hate. And it was all because of those sticks in the background. And there was nothing I could do with it. So I ended up editing one and posting this image that you see here. But you'll see the difference between the same hawk here a couple minutes later when he went back up onto a perch and found a perch with no branches. Now, the, the key learning, and I will never forget this because I was I beat myself up because Ray had moved 10 feet, 15 feet to my right and he cleared all of those branches and yeah. he ended up getting these beautiful shots. And here I was stuck with, you know, 20 minutes of perfect light on this gorgeous subject and um, and I got nothing except this one when he flew back. So that was kind of my aha moment. I think we all have those. I will never forget that. And ever since then, I made a conscious effort. One of the things I always tell people is if something lands, you know, for sure, take a few shots, document it. But as soon as you feel like you've gotten that shot, start looking all through the camera, all through the frame and see what's happening all around it. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through a progression. I'm going to go through some perched birds. Uh, I've got like five or six here. Then Ray's going to jump over and he's going to show you some examples. Hey, Scott, real um, quick, same thing. while you're talking yeah. about this, while you were uh, chatting there, I searched out that exact moment you were talking about. So hop back to the previous photo. Uh, I got a split screen right now. And um, just so the audience can kind of see uh, the shot. Yeah, you're you going to hurt got, me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. up on the screen is what you're seeing where I moved to the right. Now, I still wouldn't consider this photo like an amazing photo, but you can see it's perched on those same branches there. Um, but, you know, all those sticks and everything underneath the bird. And the background is vastly different there. So uh, just sometimes moving around, even when you think, um, you know, uh, with what you're looking at currently is horrible. 
uh, sometimes moving around and changing your perspective can work. Um, that being said, yeah. this was a, an incredibly cooperative bird, so this doesn't always kind of work out that way. All right, back to yeah, you. And it's incredible. Like, it doesn't even look like it's in the same place. Like, Correct. we're literally yeah. <laughs> standing 15 feet apart yeah. shooting the same bird, and it doesn't even look like the same background. So let me run through a couple of these. Um, this is a, uh, a Brewster's Warbler I'm going to start with. So this is a hybrid. Love it's a bird. gold wing and um, blue winged warbler hybrid. It's pretty rare. I don't, I've, I've only seen one in my life. Um, so one of the things about this, uh, sometimes location and knowing what you wanna do is very, very helpful. So in this specific area, there's woods on the left and woods on the right. And one of the things I really look for is openings or gaps. So this is a power line cut and um, I, I'm using my car. I just set up, I find a spot that I like. And I know these birds have to, if they're gonna fly from one side to the other, they're gonna have to drop in the power line cut and land on something. So I kind of wait there um, because if I wait in the wooded area, I'm gonna get branches in the background, which I'm not gonna like. Um, so I kind of just find these openings or these gaps. Sometimes it's like parking lots or rivers, um, but the power line cuts is, I just I just think I just gave like a free tip. Power line cuts are like really, really nice. Yeah, you can nice. park next to them and just wait for the birds to drop down. So that was from a power line cut. Um, this is a prothonotary warbler that I really liked. Uh, just a nice clean background there. And I'm gonna talk in a minute, this is a black-throated green warbler. Again, a nice, this is a summer background, overcast light. Yeah, smooth really color. Really brings out the greens. Yeah, great. Yep. Here's a hooded warbler. Um, I liked this one and you'll see like a transition in the background. I, was just I just thought that. it was a little different. Yeah, I was just yep. gonna point that so out. A lot of a lot of times I'll do gradients up and down. In this case, there's kind of like a right to left gradient. Uh, so I kind of like that background. I got a bunch of this guy, but I chose this one to edit just because of that background. And it's actually in the rain. I wish you could see the details. If you look up in the top left corner, there's actually like some raindrops coming down, which is kind of cool. Um, this is one of my favorite images. Uh, this is a black and white warbler. One of the things that I, I have um, tried to focus on is proximity so this concept of distance is really important with backgrounds so the closer you are to the subject the further away the background is going to appear even if it's the same distance so yep. in other words if the background is 10 feet away from this warbler and i'm 10 feet away from this warbler the background's going to look a certain way if the background's 10 feet away from the warbler and i get closer to the warbler the background is going to appear to be out of focus or more out of focus. So you're so focusing I really... closer, which makes that background more out of focus. Yep, exactly. And so that's something I've really worked on over the last year is um, just is just proximity and knowing that the closer I can get to the subject, which is not always easy, but the closer I can get to the subject, uh, the better that background is going to tend to look. Um, I'm going to give, uh, I think I got like two or three more here, and then I'm going to kick over to Ray so he can drop a few. This is another example of a really close background on a black-throated blue. There we go. Um, this yeah, one right. is minimum focus. So this is on a 300 2.8 with a teleconverter, which allows me to get six feet away. If I can get six feet away, I end up with these really cool images. The neat thing about this is the background really isn't that far behind the bird, but it looks like it's just melted away because uh, I'm so close to the bird. So yeah. kind of a neat, a neat concept. Um, this is an example of one I wanted to show. I was shooting these cerulean warblers, which are always over your head. This one drops low and, he, and I was shooting with Mark Stroll. Uh, we were together. And I noticed there was this color, I, and I don't know if it was a rock behind it or what it was, but it was all green and, and branches. But by changing my elevation, so I lowered myself about two to three feet, I was able to get this different background. And again, I was shooting through the subject. I, I got the shots. I knew I'd gotten like 100 shots of this guy already. But I thought, let me try and see if I can get a different color in the background. And so with the blue and then kind of these orange tones or pink tones, I thought it worked really well. Um, so instead of selecting the green background, which was all my other shots, I ended up reverting and, and picking this one to post. So it's a cerulean warbler. Beautiful. And then just two more perched birds. And, and instead of going with uh, warblers and songbirds, I just wanted to show two raptors perched or a raptor and a, I've got a waiter that's uh, at a rookery next. This is a mountain background. So one of the things that I really focus on with raptors, with all birds really, is just try not to get blue skies. Blue skies are boring. They're there a lot. 
Uh, so you're going to see a lot of people posting them. And if you want to separate your work, I think uh, one of the things you can do is really look at the background. So I'm driving past. I see this Merle, uh, this uh, Kestrel. Uh, I know this Kestrel. I know where he hangs out. And I've never seen him on this tree, so I was really excited. Uh, I'm driving past, and instead of just stopping in one spot and, and shooting, I'm kind of – I shouldn't actually advertise that I do this, but I kind of drive without stopping. <laughs> and I'm taking pictures as I go and making sure nobody's around, be safe. And then um, – because I want to see different backgrounds. So I can't get up and walk, but I can keep the car kind of moving. Uh, at different angles, the background looked different. So I was able to get this mountain – behind this Kestrel, which I really liked, uh, rather than just, again, blue sky or something else. And then just one more. We were at a rookery. A lot of people shoot this in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, we had this this guy perched. So changing left to right, up and down. I just remember shooting this and, and constantly adjusting positions until I got the cleanest background that I could find. So there was no sky in this one. The sky, the horizon's like kind of right there. So I kind of adjusted my height to get the horizon out of it. Uh, didn't really even crop this much at all. It was pretty much um, ready to go out of the camera because I was able, he was just sitting there in gorgeous light. So we composed it in the camera uh, and then just kind of let it fly. So that's some of the perch birds I wanted to go through. But main concepts was just, you know, distance from the bird, getting closer is going to help your backgrounds. I actually have a blog about this. Ray will throw it in the in, um, what he posts it, just a link to it. Yeah, certainly. Um, but it's kind of broken up, and it does talk about distance and how that affects backgrounds. Uh, the other one is seeing through the subject. And one of the things you'll I, I shoot with Ray all the time, so I can tell you he does a great job with this, is he's constantly, as soon as he, you hear a couple frames, he's moving yeah. and changing position, especially if it's not a bird, uh, if it's a perch bird that's not moving a lot. Yep. Um, you'll never see him stationary in one spot which is why you'll never see almost never see him with a tripod yeah <laughs> and uh <laughs> he's almost always with either a monopod or, or hand holding because he always wants to move around and, and get some different background so i'll kick it back to you yeah you know what that's a great point uh real quick i want to answer a question dave watson asked what aperture do you use mostly to blur the background for birds uh, i think i can speak for both scott and i uh for the most part probably 90 percent or even more of our photography our bird photography is shot wide open so we both shoot a 500 millimeter f4 lens and 90 percent of the time i'm shooting that lens on f4 um it's just a look that i like to go with and uh you know it doesn't necessarily always keep the bird entirely in focus but my goal is to nail usually the eye but mostly the head um and as long as the bird like the the image scott's showing on the screen right now that uh, black crown night heron um i'm assuming that was probably their shot wide open or really close to it and uh, yeah. <clears throat> as long as the bird is parallel to the focal plane, uh, the entire bird's going to be in focus there. So, um, yeah, you pretty much shoot that way all the time, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah. I, and uh, I know a lot of people, we also host that critique site, if, if any, the wildlife photography critique, and a lot of comments in there from other people will say, oh, the bird's not in focus, the tail's out of focus, or the wings are out of focus. Um, I think Ray and I both do the same thing and it's just personal preference some Correct. people want the whole bird in focus yeah. and you may enter a, a photo into a competition and, and may get feedback from the judge well it wasn't all in focus yep. i will tell you as long as the eyes in focus and most of the head that's all i care about yeah i'm with you on that um all right um and uh, i also want to mention what you just kind of brought up with uh you know um the equipment the fact that we both shoot on a monopod or a lot of times on the ground uh, i'm using a ground pod or just carrying the lens around and uh, part of the reason of not using that tripod is exactly that I, you know i want to be able to move sometimes it's even you know it's three inches four inches to the left or you know a foot to the right it's not huge movements it's not like you have to physically move your body sometimes uh, or sometimes i want to lower my perspective or raise it just to uh, clean that background up or get what I want in the background and those movements I find so much easier to do on a monopod uh, while I'm shooting than you know uh, adjust three separate legs on a tripod make sure it's level when you lower it or pick up the whole thing and plunk it down to the right and make sure it's level again so um, you know with a monopod you get the stability you don't have to hold the weight of the heavy rig uh, but you get the flexibility of moving around which I think is definitely a great thing um, and really helps us deal with these backgrounds so Yep. Uh, all right, cool. So um, I'm just going to hit a few uh, clean perch birds here. And as you can see, I'll leave my settings up so you guys can have an idea of what I'm shooting at. Um, here's a tree swallow. Uh, and 
this goes to what Scott was talking about with focusing really close to the bird. So uh, I barely cropped this image. It was shot really close like this. And the marsh grasses in the background that, um, you know, are normally, there are a bunch of vertical blades of marsh grass. They just completely melt away and give this smooth green background. Uh, Canada warbler, same thing. There's a bunch of trees and shrubs and everything on the opposite side of this opening that the bird came down into. And because I was so close, the background just completely melted away to a nice smooth green background. Um, very flattering to the bird and non-distracting. <clears throat> same thing, here's the prothonotary warbler. Shot this in the same area Scott shot his prothonotary warbler. Um, you know, going for a clean background and also, you know, I'm always trying to pay attention to including something interesting in with the bird there so it's not just a, a straight stick or something like that this one has a couple of nice little green spring um, growth on it there and uh, worm eating warbler this one I specifically positioned myself to get this it was a um, a whole I guess grove you would say of ferns growing on the ground that were just they were all brand new so they they were almost fluorescent green when you saw them with your eye uh, they were just a really bright vivid green and uh, when this bird landed down on this mossy log, having that green fern in the background just made for a really wonderful background. And then let's, uh, here's a perfect example of the gradients that Scott was mentioning earlier. Um, a loggerhead shrike down in Florida. And I remember I was actually shooting out of my car, which I don't do very often because I like to kind of get out of the car and move around. But um, this bird was pretty spooky every time I got out of the car, so I kind of realized I just needed to stay in the car um, in order to get closer. So I remember actually uh, lifting my camera up and shoving it up against the roof of the open window, like as high as I could go, so I could place that bird exactly in that green band in the background. So uh, this background was probably a good, I'd say, two to three hundred feet behind the bird. And um, I specifically wanted to get that tritone thing happening there. So the, the brown that indicates ground, the green tree line, and then the blue sky, uh, just to make things a little bit more interesting versus just a clean blue. Like if I had stayed just seated in my car and not lifted up, I would have pretty, I would have had like a little bit of green and some of the blue background. Um, so I actively had to you know, be a little bit uncomfortable, even though I was in a car, can't get that uncomfortable, uh, and kind of lift everything up just to get that perspective. And uh, those are the things that you got to start really thinking about, you know, when you when you first get that shot, um, look behind the birds, do what Scott said, see through the bird and see what's back there and make a conscious decision. If I move left, can I fix this? If I move right or up or down or, you know, just change my angle in any way, what can I do to improve the background? Uh, sometimes you get lucky and it's perfect where the bird lands, but that's not very often. Um, here's another gradient background. I go to this place every summer to photograph these seaside sparrows, and one of the reasons is uh, this is just a wide open marsh, so the uh, marsh grasses and the horizon are quite literally a mile or two more away in the background, and when you shoot it at f4 wide open and the bird is relatively close, you get these beautiful soft uh, transitions in the background and I specifically have to kind of lower my perspective if I was standing up tall um, I would see nothing but just the green down here which isn't bad it's still a nice smooth green background um, but I personally feel like when you get a little bit lower and include that horizon in the background you actually give it a little bit more of a sense of place so you can kind of see that it's an, a wide open marsh um, you know you can kind of tell that there's a, a horizon back there and also it just kind of puts you a little bit more on that uh, birds level which I think is a great thing so uh, now we're gonna move on to waterfowl uh, waterfowl is let's see um, waterfowl is a little bit more about foreground and background and it's mostly about perspective uh, in my opinion with the background so and, and that perspective is a vertical perspective so the lower you can get and more on the eye level it's always a nice pleasing perspective to kind of view it view the wildlife from its own perspective. Uh, but what that does when you get low is it also introduces an out of focus foreground and a very soft out of focus background. Um, I know Scott's gonna have a few great examples of this, uh, but I just wanted to show, this is kind of just like a classic waterfowl shot here, this Northern Pintail. Um, I was laying right down, uh, I was maybe like I don't know, less than a foot above the, the surface of the water there. Nice smooth foreground and just a nice clean background that was far away. Uh, so Scott, I will hand it back to you. There you go. You got another nice uh, 
teal there. Yeah, so a couple things when you're shooting perched birds, you, you have a little bit of an advantage that the bird could be, you know, 10 degrees below you or 10 degrees above you and you can still get pleasing backgrounds. You're never going to be good when it's 45 degrees above you because you're going to be shooting the bottom of the bird. But, you know, within that span, so when you talk about like eye level with a perch bird, you have a little bit of play. Um, unless you're Santosh and you're going to get underwater gear, it's hard to get below waterfowl, but you can do it. Uh, but with standard gear, you're looking at being close to the water. And Ray's got a great example of this in a minute that he's going to share. Yeah. But when you're even a foot or two higher than the water, it makes a significant difference. So just think about the angle. You know, I'm six feet tall, so six feet shooting down at a bird. Or if I kneel, I'm three feet tall shooting down at a bird. I will absolutely get water in the background every time, and I will never see what's on the far shore. And a lot of times that's what's going to create the background. So with this teal that I've got up now, there's two things I wanted to show. One is that background is pretty far away. It's hundreds of feet away and the bird is pretty close. Uh, it's probably 40, 30, 40 feet away. So pretty close. It, it was filling the frame. I was really excited about that, but the background just melts away. Uh, I have an example of what happens. This is the, ex I'm literally in the exact same spot shooting uh, a shoveler. This is the exact same background. I'm in the same spot. And this is a pleasing image. Just, to me, there's nothing wrong with this. But look at the difference in the background from that, which is completely out of focus, yep. to that, which you can start to tell. Now, it doesn't mean one's better or worse. It just means it's different. You may like this because you can tell it's like marsh grass. Yeah, I would actually um, for I me, prefer this one um, yep. just because it has more of a sense of place at the setting. Uh, but yep. the other one has obviously way better isolation. Yep. So, and that's what that distance is all about. So again, the distance from me to the background has not changed in either shot, yeah. but the background appears much different because the subject is further away and the lens is for uh, focusing further away. So two shots that I really liked, but just a, a little bit different. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, yep. We also lumped some shorebirds in here. Shorebirds, the same concept. Ray and I both shoot shorebirds the same way. We're as low as we can get. The, the advantage with shorebirds is, um, and I can testify to this, you can't dunk your equipment into yeah. <laughs> sand and have it ruined, but you can do that in water. Hey, before so, you get um, too far on that, let me hit that uh, hooded yeah. merganser for the perspective sure. real quick. Um, yep. So here's a hooded merganser on a local private pond that I photograph them every year. Uh, this was one of the first years I photographed them, so it was a little bit before I knew a lot what I was doing here. So nothing horrible about this photo. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, cleanish foreground and background. But you can see the water behind the bird and in front of the bird isn't that out of focus. So um, there, it takes till you get all the way back here until you get some really soft background, all the way up here until you get some really soft foreground. Um, so uh, it's not horrible here. So this is the same exact location um, and one I took this year. And I was actually in the water on this one. So uh, the camera was hovering, I don't know, probably about, uh, I'd say three, four inches off the surface of the water. And um, you can now see that the only thing in focus is the bird. So there's this real thin line of in focus water, but everything in the foreground is out of focus and everything in the background is out of focus. And now I can actually start to see the background behind there. So this is the tree line on the opposite side uh, of the pond. Whereas in this one, I can't see any of that. Um, so, you know, also notice the the feeling here right you can kind of tell you're kind of still looking down on this bird uh from like maybe i don't know i was probably maybe three four feet above the surface um which again a lot of people think that's low but when you compare it to a couple of inches off the surface of the water uh, you can feel this duck almost feels like it's swimming directly at you um, so that perspective is great for a connection with the subject uh, but also just notice the difference between uh those two uh, backgrounds and foregrounds there. So uh, just wanted to hit that real quick and back to you, Scott. Yep. So we're just going to transition to um, to some shorebirds. Yeah, so same cool. concept. We're getting low. I, I did see a question. Santosh already answered it. So getting low in the water is two things. One is um, a lot of laying next to the shore. So you have to find an area that's got a slope that you can lay on. Um, so if you're shooting ducks yeah. specifically, you lay it on the shore, you're trying to get as low as possible. It's not easy. There's options to get in the water. So you can take your tripod, jump, throw on some waders and get in. We've done that and had a lot of success with that as well. 
So there are options to actually get in the water, um, but you need to just be careful. And again, I can yeah. tell you from experience, be careful. It's just, basically, it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, I've laid uh, on the side, like with the hooded mergansers, I've laid along this pond for uh, three, four hours um, trying to get photos like this. And, you know, my back is killing me. My neck is killing me. My elbows are hurting from holding myself up so I can look through the camera. Uh, but, you know, if, if you really want to commit and get these kinds of photos, that's sometimes what it takes. Um, you know, it doesn't always mean you just go out and it's just everything's easy and comfortable and pleasant. You know, sometimes you have to really work for it. And that's not always the case. And uh, that's also not how everybody wants to approach this. Uh, but for me, that's definitely part of it. And, uh, you know, this female hooded merganser I'm showing right now, uh, she swam right in. You know, I had three of them kind of hanging out probably about anywhere from five to ten feet from me for about a five minute period. And I was just snapping away and they had no clue I was there. But it took two hours of laying there for me to get that. Uh, here's another drake hooded merganser. Uh, just swimming by, perfect reflection, nice low angle, soft, smooth background. Uh, this was one that wasn't quite as low as I normally like to get, but it worked really well to give me the clean background and foreground. So this was probably a foot off the surface of the water, which is why we're not seeing the opposite horizon. And then uh, one last perched one, um, a harlequin duck at Barnegat Light. And uh, it's not easy to do, but I was really hanging low on some of the jetty rocks and I actually was able to include some horizon in the background on these, uh, this duck, which really, again, gives you a sense of place. It feels like you're laying next to the bird there. And what it does is it puts that background literally miles away from me and it gives me that nice soft gradient transition. So, uh, you know, looking down on this bird from on top of the jetty, it's nothing but water in the background getting myself and changing the perspective and thinking about the background that I wanted, which was horizon, I was able to make that happen. So yeah, sure birds. Back to you, Scott. Yeah. And just a couple questions came in one angle viewfinders. Yes. Um, if you're changing from birds that are low, that might go in flight. No, because it's, you can't, once you put an angle viewfinder on, you're really committed to things that, yeah, you can't track anything. But uh, yes, I know Ray uses them, and I do also time. use a ninety, yeah. yep, ninety degree um, viewfinder. That'll it'll save your neck. So if you're shooting waterfowl, it'll help you get the camera lower while your head is still above. So if you have waders on, you can keep your body and your head above the water, yep. and you can look down into the camera. Yeah, totally. And then with shorebirds, it's it's just saving your neck. Yeah, definitely. And then camo, yep, camo, uh, Ray. That too. Yep, uh, I will. I'll tell you real quick. I have a couple spots I shoot waterfowl and. If I'm shooting from the shore, I've actually piled some stuff up along the shore because I'm the only one I think that goes to this one spot. So it, I kind of made a blind out of it. Um, yeah, I've done the same. And I know Ray does the same thing. Yep. Uh, or I just have a portable camo throw blind that I just kind of chuck over top of me and take it with me wherever I go. Uh, but not all birds require that. Uh, and especially all these shorebirds we're going to talk about, I've never used camo for shorebirds. Have you, Scott? No, no, nah, yeah. there's no need. To. There's no need to. So sometimes it's just it really depends on the species. Waterfowl are incredibly spooky and tough to get close to. They generally require using them. So, um, you know, camo is good for them, but not necessary for shorebirds and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Shorebirds, we just you're just going to lay down and, and wait and be patient. If you move, they're going to they're going to spook and keep moving away. But if you just kind of lay down, this one walks right past me. Um, one of the things I liked about this is it's, it shows again, the low angle, there's a gradient to the background and the gradient comes in with the ocean. So the darker blue is the ocean, the lighter blue is the sky. Um, and that's something that you can really get when you get super low, you'll get gradients from grass to trees. And I think we have some examples of that. Um, and then you also get these really cool pebbling effects, um, with the rocks, some yeah. in focus, some out of focus. This was just an example of something different in the background. I don't really love this picture, but it's a red knot. Um, some people love these crashing waves behind, but again, I wanted yeah, to try cool. it and see if see if I liked it. I didn't hate it, but it wasn't my favorite thing. But again, just an example of you know noticing what's behind the bird and saying, hey, let me try something and see what it, if I like how it looks. And I do uh, want to mention, an, look at these shorebirds. Yep. All you ever have when you're low like this or anything on the water or ground level is this razor thin in focus uh, piece of either land or water. And what that really does is it makes the bird just pop. You know, a lot of people will mention it gives it that 3D effect. Um, and it, it kind of does that. You know, the only thing in focus is your subject. And when that's the only thing in focus, uh, obviously your eye goes directly to that subject. So that's certainly another advantage of getting these super low perspectives. But then obviously you have to pay attention to what's behind there as well. Yep. 
So the one that's up there now, this is a black belly plover Ray and I shot together um, two different perspectives on this. So um, I got the better one. I'm not going to lie. I was looking at one <laughs> angle. <laughs> I was looking at one angle and I kind of saw the green rocks. Uh, this is these are like moss covered jetty behind it. And that's what I wanted in the background. Ray moved a different way. He was seeing something different. I think he wanted to try to get the water or something behind it. So he totally failed. And the green behind it, I really liked. So anyway, um, just again, kind of seeing before we knew the bird was kind of between us and these rocks. It was just a matter of having a little bit of planning to say, okay, what do I want? We know eventually the bird's going to walk back to us. So what do I want in the background? Do I want, you know, the rocks? Do I want the beach? Do I want the water? Do I want just clear sky? So just an example of that. Real this quick, I want to answer, answer a yep. couple questions before they get away from me. Um, Dave sure. Watson asks about how about a kayak? Uh, Dave, I think a kayak is great to get close to certain things, but when we're talking low perspective, keep in mind we're talking about less than a foot off the surface of the water. Uh, sometimes it's mere inches when it's on the beach. It definitely is inches off the surface of the sand, and I've actually like dug holes to actually get myself even lower on the sand. Um, so a kayak, it would be pretty uncomfortable or you know tough and maybe not safe without tipping over to get really low. Uh, if you're two to three feet above the water, um, it can be. It's definitely better than eight feet over the water, but uh, that's not quite the really low perspective we're talking about. So that is the issue with kayaks. And then uh, Brian Collier asks, what percentage of your captures are from being stationary and waiting for birds to come to you versus just walking around and finding birds? Uh, is there a preferred approach? Um, Brian, that's, that's a little bit of a topic we're gonna, probably going to uh, really talk about in an upcoming thing. But just real quick to tell you, um, I'd say probably about Oh, gosh, I don't know, maybe 70% are me really planning and going and knowing what species I want and, and waiting for it. I mean, sometimes I'm moving, but it's not like I'm just wandering around uh, seeing what's going to happen. Um, you know, that was definitely something I used to do back in the day, and you get lucky sometimes, but most of my outings now are, actually, and it's probably higher percent, it's probably like 90% of my outings now are uh, a planned outing to go to a specific location and either wait for it or try and make a slow approach on a specific bird. Um, so sorry for the interruption there, Scott. I just want to answer those questions. Yep. Nope. Totally agree on, on that as well. Just um, chasing birds is, is probably not going to result in great pictures. You'll see more birds. Correct. You'll take more bad pictures, yep. um, but you won't have things that you're going to hang on your wall. So you just have to kind of figure out if you're a birder and you just like to document pictures, wrong with that. by all means, yeah. go on a hike and enjoy. Um, if you want to get something to put on your wall, you're probably going to want to plan it out and just Sometimes you and sometimes you're going to sit for a couple hours and get nothing. And sometimes um, this, you'll get anyway. something you didn't plan for, but you know you're yep. <laughs> set up in a great position to make a nice photo. So yeah, let's yep. hit that beautiful Dunlin. Yep. So just Dunlin again, nice background, just a good example of low perspective, um, including some grasses. These grasses are not that far behind, but the Dunlin's pretty close. So again, they they show up out of focus. Um, and then I think I, I kind of transition into foregrounds after this race. So I'll turn it back yeah, to you I if got you had any Yeah, I got a couple other... of quick uh, backgrounds, okay. uh, low ones here. So um, uh, yellow legs here. I, you know, here's a perfect example, Dave, to answer the question you just asked. Uh, I really planned the shot out. I knew there were shorebirds hanging out in this pond. So I actually arrived about 40 minutes before sunrise and I was set up on the water uh, or the edge of the water, actually, uh, laying in just like some mud. And um, as soon as the sun rose and the birds started moving around, they just kind of walked right to me. So this was definitely a planned shoot, and I got these yellow legs coming right to me here. And this was interesting. So this is, I never moved, uh, and I got this yellow legs here went on a, in this nice, beautiful green background, and then it walked a little bit more, and the sun came up a little bit more, and I got this golden uh, colored background. So uh, sometimes one position can yield a couple of different unique backgrounds, and I think they both work equally as well, but they just kind of give a different vibe to them. Um, here is one I shot this year, a uh, pectoral sandpiper. And this is another thing I really love to do. And I was talking about it earlier with Scott's image, how it's just that one line of razor thin in focus stuff. And uh, with this one, I actually had a little bit of out of focus foreground blur as well. But, um, you know, getting as this low is what gave me this really far away, clean, green, bright green grass background. Um, and when I, even if I just kneeled in this location, there was actually a bunch of mud and everything right on the other side of this little hill of grass uh, that just did not look good at all. So um, getting really low actually made a big difference on this. And uh, 
All right, yeah, here I'm back into some foreground stuff here. So go ahead, Scott. Let's uh let's talk a little bit about foreground stuff because that's definitely something I'm interested in. Yeah, so Ray's got some great examples. I'll throw out a few here. Uh, but again, Ray mentioned low perspective, and when you're when you're low, you're also going to get some foreground blur. So this is just an example of that foreground blur. You can see some people don't like this, by the way, and that's totally fine. Uh, I do like it. So you could see the sand. Um, almost looks like it's bleeding into the sky. Yeah. The only thing you don't want to do is get that up into their head. So as long as I'm clear of the head, I'm good with that. Um, but some examples of how I like to use foreground, I do a lot of songbirds. So this is actually one I posted uh, today. And birds that are typically in dense areas, yeah. I love to include foreground and, and kind of like trap them in. So uh, if you guys have ever been out in the woods, you might have heard a black-billed cuckoo. You probably haven't seen a whole lot of them. They're just re they're, they just don't come out very yeah, often. Very I was lucky to yeah, I was I was lucky to get this one actually out in the open. I got the long, beautiful tail and everything. Um, I I edited this one as well, even though you don't see the whole bird. I kind of felt like well, this this is more typical of the species. So I went ahead and I edited this one, um, even though you don't see the tail and some of the great features it was more typical of the bird. So sometimes knowing the species and knowing um, what it's about will lend you to that. And I have one more example very similar to that, a uh, northern water thrush. A lot of people nice. might look at this and say, you know, oh my gosh, you, it's too bad you got these leaves in front of it. Um, there's like a little blur over here. I looked at that and said, well, that's what a water thrush is. You don't see them out in the open. You always see them in these dense, and there's even raindrops in here. I don't know if you guys can tell that this is this picture was taken in, in the rain, but that's to me that's what a water thrush is. So there, there's a little bit of birder in me that I really like to show the species and what it does. Um, sometimes I will go for these clean portraits. I love that as well. But when it's a species that isn't always clean, I like to kind of show it in its environment. Um, I got a couple more foreground pictures. I think I have two more, or maybe just one more. Uh, this is a cerulean warbler. Uh, kind of same thing, just framed a little bit with some foreground. So you can use foreground elements to frame branches and leaves, and that can be really effective. So rather than, you know, maybe edit these leaves out or try to change and, and wait for them to go on a totally clean perch, I liked this shot um, because it was framed with the foreground leaves. And then this was a, nice. a, another example of a, um, a, a Ray showed one earlier. Yeah, with three backgrounds, three layers. It looks like a flag to me almost like it's got these three perfectly horizontal elements so the this gray down here is on a gravel road uh, so i got really really low because i wanted to include that and most people have heard of the rule of thirds but if you haven't you can google it it's it's a beginning concept but breaking um your backgrounds or your subjects onto thirds is kind of uh some kind of artistic um, guide but this one kind of works. So we got gray in the middle. This is a field of corn that's uh, dead. So you get these golden colors from that. And then this is a tree line. But because it's all so far out of focus and I'm so low, those that tree line is probably miles away. The cornfield's hundreds of feet away. And then the gravel's actually in the foreground before the bird. But it all blends together and creates these gradients. So I like these gradients in my really backgrounds. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, and that's a Vesper Sparrow. That was actually a lifer. That was the first one I'd ever photographed. So I really liked that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, you have any other foreground stuff? Uh, I think that's it. Okay, cool. So um, what I want to mention about foregrounds are uh, that's something I didn't even kind of acknowledge or pay attention to until well into my wildlife photography career. So, um, you know, I really started learning backgrounds and paying attention to them. But most of the time what I shot was, you know, there, there almost was no foreground. So, um, you know, you're, you're standing up or even if you're starting to kneel and get a little bit lower, you know, the first thing that's in the, the front of the image is usually your subject and then there's a background, you know, so maybe there's, you know, a foot or so of something in the foreground a little bit in front of the, uh, the bird or the subject. Uh, but generally speaking, you kind of crop it and um, you're not really paying attention or including a lot of foreground. Um, because a lot of times foreground stuff can get in the way. Uh, so what I started realizing after a while is I could actually start to include more foreground stuff. And, you know, it's now yet another element I have to pay attention to. So, you know, pardon me, um, making sure my subject looks good, is doing something interesting in focus, well exposed, 
now I'm paying attention to my background, making sure that's clean and nice, and now I'm adding the foreground to that. So it's a lot to think about, and it sounds like a lot, especially if you've never done it before, but once you start kind of incorporating, paying attention to foregrounds as well into your photography, uh, it, it eventually does become kind of second nature. And uh, here's a perfect example of this Willet. Um, you know, I could have easily uh, lifted my camera up another foot or so and still had a nice smooth out of focus background behind this bird uh, but I wouldn't have had this all this beautiful out of focus foreground and uh, uh, you know these birds are often seen walking through these you know waist high or um, I'm sorry like ankle high marshes and uh, you know you just kind of see it popping out like that and I love to start including foreground elements like that uh, let's see, I think there was a question. Yeah, Zephyr asks, with the big primes, what do you guys use to, use to hold up the glass, if anything? Uh, if you didn't hear that earlier, Zephyr, um, I'm almost always shooting on a monopod, or if it's ground level stuff, like the photo you're looking at right now of this piping plover chick, um, that is on a ground pod, or just kind of in my hand laying on the ground, but for this Willet shot here previously, uh, definitely on a monopod for that. Um, I like the flexibility and ability to move around uh, a lot more than a tripod with the monopod. Uh, so yeah, here's a piping plover, kind of the same thing Scott was talking about. So starting to include this out of fo focus foreground um, actually, you know, uh, gives you some better isolation, a little bit more of a sense of place and kind of draws you into the photo. Um, here was a photo and nothing is super out of focus here. Uh, you can definitely tell the setting of this chipmunk is in the forest. Um, and there was, there was actually a reason that I ended up composing it this way and getting all this out of focus foreground stuff in here is because this little guy was actually sitting up on a wooden boardwalk up here uh, that was for everybody to kind of walk down this path on. Um, and uh, he kept going to this spot. He actually had a hole in the boardwalk that he kept popping up and out of. Um, so when I realized that I wanted to photograph him there and that was probably one of the easiest places I could continually get him over and over again, uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't see any of that wooden uh, walkway, which would kind of give it that human element. So I hung off the side of the boardwalk, which was elevated by like maybe six inches or three or four inches, something like that maybe. Um, and I actually just put a bunch of, you know, I didn't put it there, but I. I positioned myself so a bunch of leaves and other stuff were out of focus and in the foreground. And by doing that, the only thing that ended up in focus was this little chipmunk. So even in this wide overall scene, the chipmunk kind of just stands out due to him being the only thing in focus and me having a lot of like all this stuff was in the foreground was out of focus and everything like that. Uh, and then here's back at that rookery in Ocean City. Um, and uh, let's see, this one was... Uh, we were walking around the thing. Scott was actually with me this day. He has a similar shot. We were walking around the um, elevated platform looking out at the rookery with the, the nesting birds and all the young birds. And I just happened to walk by and see through this one little hole this, uh, this juvenile sitting in a nest. Or actually, I think he may have been out of a nest. But anyway, he was just perched there. And there was just this one little hole through the opening of the trees. And the bird was getting sun, but the trees in the foreground were not. So it gave me this perfect scenario to include a lot of foreground to give it a little bit more of an artistic composition because uh, it doesn't really give it a sense of place since everything's out of focus. Um, but it just kind of makes it a little bit more interesting that you're kind of looking through this hole. It almost feels like you're peeking in on the, a nest or something like that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to starting to talk about this now. Uh, these, this image that you're looking at right now is starting to get a little bit more into artistic and really creative foregrounds and backgrounds. Uh, I do want to just mention a couple of other questions. Let's see. Ray asks, how did you get that low with your monopod with the Willet? Um, just popping back to that, I wasn't that low. So Willet is kind of tall uh, for a shorebird. And I think I was, you know, monopod was extended all the way down and I probably actually leaned it forward. So the monopod was angled forward so I could get just enough uh, foreground element in there. And, and place the bird exactly where I wanted it. So even with it connected to the monopod, I can actually tilt the monopod head. So I'm using a tilt head on the monopod. And if I lean the monopod forward or backward, I can actually get even lower, even when the monopod is uh, extended all the way down. So that's one of the, the flexible things I love about using a monopod um, versus a tripod. And, uh, and then, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to run through. We're going to do some creative backgrounds at the end. I did want to go through a segment on birds in flight. Did you have any more questions to answer? Uh, Was there any other ones that came up? No, it does not. Yeah, go for it. 
Okay. Yeah. So just with birds in flight, a couple things. Um, I shoot a lot of birds in flight in fall. I'm a raptor geek. So I sit up on a mountain for a long time and just watch birds migrate. This first one is actually coming off the mountain. I guess it's a little bit of birds in flight and a little bit of foreground, but I saw this field in a barn swallow. And typically with flying birds, they're over your head. So you're, again, you're getting blue sky and I would just encourage anyone who's shooting birds in flight to really think about how you can get rid of the blue and add something else. This is the base of the mountain behind this um, barn swallow. Uh, A couple more just real quick. I have one from, this is again the rookery, uh, clean background, just looking at instead of the bird being slightly above into the blue, getting it down into the green adds something different. When you do shoot blue skies, one of the things that's nice is in this Merlin, uh, this was at the Hawk Watch at Bake Oven Knob, is there's clouds in the background. So days where you've got some white clouds, that can really make a difference rather than just blue sky. Here, the, uh, I think I, I included this for perspective. So again, showing you even with eagles at Cottawingo Dam, a lot of people shoot from the top down. I like to shoot, and, and I think Ray and Santosh and everybody that we shoot with, Mark, we all like to get down a little bit lower so we can get these uh, kind of clean shots through to the other side, especially in fall. I think we have some selections at the end yeah. for for colors too. Uh, when you're choosing birds in flight, think about elevation. If you're if you're on the ground, the raptors have no other place to be but over your head. Sure. Uh, so again, if you're at a mountain, you have chances for them to come down low. So this is a sharp shinned hawk. We call it the bowl. He kind of swung down into the bowl in front of us, and we were able to get a top. Uh, side shot, which is always cool for hawks to get a topside view, but it also presents a really nice background. Um, dark backgrounds are ideal. So yeah, here's dark that. clouds with a sunlit eagle kind of opening up and fanning up on the dark background. So again, when you're thinking about backgrounds, Ray and I both lit up. Uh, we were with Mark. We saw these dark clouds rolling in, and we were like, "Oh man, this is this could look and the really sun cool." Was still hitting. The yeah, the sun was closer. out. Yeah, it was nice. Yep. So imagine if that's just blue sky, it's really not dramatic. There's nothing really interesting. It's just another eagle shot. For me personally, when I saw that, I was kind of like, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, And then again, here's a horizon. I have a couple examples here. Anytime I can get the bird a little above or a little below the horizon, I think it's cool. It adds a a little twist. Um, This is a sharp shinned hawk coming right at me. But again, you see there's other elements in the picture. If this is just on a blue sky, The only thing you can do is super crop it like wing to wing and try to make it like this unbelievably close image, but that you're going to lose so much detail and it's just not going to work. So if you can include other elements, um, that's really neat too. Again, standard eagle shot, blue sky, this isn't really much, but a little bit of trees in the background. Here's a broad wing hawk. These are pretty tough to... Yeah, pretty tough to photograph these because they don't really come close. Um, But again, we got it on the horizon, so makes it a much better shot um, for one of those flying birds. And then another sharp shinned hawk, again, just a little bit of horizon. These are mountains um, in the far background. And I think that's it. All right, cool. Um, I actually had, uh, yeah, here's a couple of quick flight shots. Um, So uh, Snow Goose. Uh, there was a clump of trees in the background, so um, when I was trying motion blurs, having those trees actually showed the blur versus just a blue sky, which there would be nothing there to actually see, uh, see the blur against. So that helps show the motion blur in this case. And then um, uh, I just had this example of a northern harrier in flight. So uh, this bird, if it was against the sky or just more of this light um, grasses, it wouldn't really stand out so well, but having it against the dark tree background, which is exactly where I position myself to get this, uh, really makes the bird kind of stand out and, uh, and pop off that background. And then I had a few more foreground shots that I did want to just kind of go through quickly here that, I, that I missed. Um, so, uh, including a lot of out of focus background here, or a lot of out of focus foreground, uh, here for this clapper rail, uh, made it a little bit more of a unique perspective. Um, this one is completely out of focus foreground and background. I was probably like three inches off the surface of the water for this one. It was a really calm day and, uh, it really works for isolation. Well, um, same thing here, really low perspective, far away background gives you great separation, um, out of focus, uh, bubbles and stuff when they're backlit create these really neat bokeh balls. And I'll kind of describe that a little bit more and show more examples of that really soon. And then, um, Here's, uh, this is, I was standing in my parking lot at my condo. Uh, this bush, it gets red every year, and then there's a nice maple tree in the background. 
that has wonderful colors. So when this Song Sparrow came in, instead of standing up, I don't know if I have an example now. Uh, I have some examples of where he's kind of perched right in the foreground here, and uh, it was just like the bird and the out of focus background, which looked nice. But I really like this kind of peeking out of the bush, and uh, I found him just through this one little opening. And again, shooting from a monopod allowed me to kind of quickly move left and right to position myself properly to see this bird through that opening and include all this out of focus red foreground. So it's just, you know, the only thing in focus is the bird here. Everything else is just out of focus and colorful and bright and it really just draws your eye into the bird there. Um, again, another really low perspective. So uh, having this out of focus foreground, it just makes everything almost kind of like a, a haze into the uh, little sand dune that the um, uh, Sandpiper was standing on. And then uh, with this perched, uh, I didn't really like the perch too well on the snowy owl. So I have some where I shot it, where I was standing up, but then I started looking around trying to figure out a way to hide it and make it more interesting. And I found this little sand dune in the foreground and I just lowered my perspective and just kind of positioned myself to get this nice kind of swoop and this curl here and made a little bit more of an interesting composition out of it. And then yeah, we're back to the flight stuff here. So. All right, let's hit. Uh, you're ready for the creative stuff, right, Scott? Yeah. Oh, actually, before we jump questions. in, uh, somebody. Yeah. Some. While you're looking at the questions, I just want to go through this. So, if you throw my screen up, um, uh, somebody yeah, sent me a message. So, yeah, Tracy's a good friend of mine. She um she sent me a few images the other day, and she said, you know, you wrote that blog. I don't know if she was just trying to make me feel good. She's like, but you were kind of in my head. I'm shooting this bluebird, and it's just blue sky, and there's nothing exciting about blue sky. So this is a pretty cool example of just somebody thinking through. Um, so she takes a couple steps. She starts to get a different background. You can see the blue is now starting to turn into green. And then a couple more steps. I didn't really plan, so I didn't have any examples like this. So this was really great that Tracy sent me this because I thought, you know what, this is a perfect example of somebody thinking through the subject. Yeah. They're in a place. They don't like the background. The subject's fine. The perch is great. Let me move and see if I can do better. She moves, she moves, and now she's got a more solid background. The subject stands out more, and it's just more interesting. I agree. It's a much better. If I, I always think of backgrounds as canvases, and what's what's a pretty canvas going to look like to put this beautiful subject against? So, really great job um, from Tracy on that one. Uh, right, kind of thinking through, and Tracy, uh, she's been uh, doing photography for a while, but she is. You could tell she thinks through things. Um, I've watched her over the last couple of years, and she's just gotten so much better. Yeah, uh, because great. of stuff like that. So great job, Tracy. Um, got a couple questions. Uh, let's see. Patrick asks, what shutter speed was the snow goose at? Uh, here were the settings. It was uh, full on bright sun that day, so I really had to jack up the aperture, but it was 1 20th of a second at F20 ISO 50, so the lowest ISO that my camera would go. And I think it was like the maximum aperture that that lens would take or close to it. So uh, not the best settings for quality, but um, that was the only thing I could do. I didn't have uh, like a drop in neutral density filter to cut the light or anything like that. So uh, I just had to kind of crank up those settings to get um, some motion blur there. So that answers that. Uh, Dave Watson asks, do you guys ever set up perches or is everything natural? Um, I'll answer for myself and then let Scott answer. Almost all of my stuff is natural, but I have set up some perches. So some of my Warbler stuff is set up. So uh, let's see, that's a setup perch, and that one was a setup perch. Uh, that was natural, that was natural, that was natural. So, you know, um, every once in a while I do set up some perches, but for the majority of my stuff, it is all natural. And uh, uh, what what do you do with that, Scott? I would, I'm mostly natural. Yeah. I'm okay. trying to think of it. I, I, once or twice I've put a perch up um, in an area where I felt like I didn't have a good background or didn't get what I wanted. I really do like them in their environment. So if they live in a certain uh, habitat, I don't want to bring in something that's that's fake or phony. Sure. Um, but I've done it. I mean, I've put a holly branch up one time because I, I wanted a boring bird to look better and it was yeah. by my feeder and I was, and I threw a holly branch up near the feeder and it looked really good. So I've yeah, done it sure. for sure. Um, and then Chris mentions, it's just a great comment I want to read. He says, I noticed that when adding all these other elements, such as a good background, a good foreground, uh, the subject doesn't need to take up as much space in the frame to captivate the viewer's interest. And he says, that's very cool. And uh, yeah, I 100% agree with that, Chris. And that's something that I've really been thinking about and playing with a lot more in my photography over the past, you know, definitely the past year or maybe two years uh, is 
you know, finding ways to make my subjects smaller in the frame yet still stand out and including some interesting or pretty to look at foregrounds and backgrounds. So uh, I'm glad you're noticing that and realizing that and thanks for making that comment. Um, so yeah, Scott, I'll throw it on your screen because you got a nice real cool dramatic image there. So I'll let you talk about that one real quick. Yeah, so the last, I guess the last kind of segment here was going to be just backgrounds that are a little bit different or maybe even dramatic. So when you deal with a brighter sun, one thing you can do is contrast it on a darker background. I know Ray's got an example, so yeah. maybe we'll do one of each, Ray. Yeah, um, but I this is a common merganser um, I exposed for the bird, the, the kind of the white breast and it darkened that dark background, which was in shade. And so you get these dramatic images. And again, the subject can be smaller in frame and still have a, a kind of a cool effect. Um, it could be a little bit larger. This one I would say is a little bit smaller for what I normally do, but about the right size and right proportion. Um, and then I think Ray's got one. I remember we shot together that. Yeah, so here cool. is um, the bald eagle that Scott was talking about earlier. He had it dramatic against like a, a stormy, cloudy sky. Um, and then it actually dove down and went just against the tree line in the background. And thankfully, the tree line was still in shade, but the bird was in sun. So same exact concept that was in Scott's shot that he just showed. Uh, full sunlight on your subject. Uh, background is some dark trees in shade. And you can just make that bird stand out on an almost solid black um, canvas. Uh, I chose to include just a little bit of detail in the blacks there, so it, it wasn't solid, but I could have gone either way there. Uh, but yeah, conceptually, it's kind of the same thing and work, works really well there. So um, what did you want to hit? Yeah. Do you have any lined up next? Yeah. And okay. if you look at uh, one of the things that's interesting is a lot of people that we were the only two people, oh, there's three of us. So yeah, we were the only three there. people shooting that. It was really so, far away. Yeah. The Conowingo Dam, there's 10,000 people in the middle of November. And and there's all these people next to us and we we kind of like wow that this could be cool because we could see the direct sunlight it was really nice light hitting the eagle and we kind of thought well dark clouds dark background it could look really cool we're the only three people with with anything happening everybody else is standing and talking i was actually and these were yelling all... out like yes yes because i could see the lighting yeah. <laughs> was so amazing <laughs> And um, and I think it was probably my favorite image of the day and Ray's favorite image of the day. And we probably took 2,000 pictures that day. So just, you know, kind of seeing yeah, exactly. what can happen with dramatic backgrounds. This was actually, um, this next one's the same day. Uh, some people thought this was a reflection of an eagle hitting the water. Nice. It's just two eagles fighting. Uh, difference, again, from a blue sky. This was later in the afternoon uh, shooting backlit and getting a silhouette. I did adjust the warmth. I didn't go crazy on it. It had some tones in it already, so I just took it a little further. So there's a temperature slider in Lightroom or any of the adjustment programs. You can dial that down sometimes or dial it up. And in this case, we dialed it up to warm and it kind of gave this neat effect. So that's just another example of, you know, kind of a different background. I have um, a really good dark background, another one here. Yeah. Um, uh, juvenile male hooded merganser. Um, backlit so just glowing in the sun so it was really funny the original of this photo was completely washed out so the sun was directly hitting the front element of my lens so it was just this kind of washed out thing but i knew if i pushed the processing pretty strong on this it would give me something interesting uh and this was a an image that i shot specifically thinking of the foreground so i knew when i was low in the water that all these bubbles and i think it was mostly like just bubbles and little just little kind of white like just feathers and junk floating in the water um, when they are get lit up by the sun backlit they kind of just glow and turn into these lovely like really interesting golden balls of light and uh, you know I really wanted an image that included that and when this bird swam in front of it I just shot um, you know hoping I could pull something out of that and when I really pushed the processing I was able to and here's another image this was off to the side so no glare so you can actually see I have some detail in the background now uh, but kind of that same foreground here and just without that heavy lens flare uh, you're able to actually see some more detail there but uh, same concept you know I was really thinking about the foreground in this image uh, and trying to do something interesting with that uh, so Scott you got those great ibis yeah so I just wanted to give you three examples of shots with blue sky that don't work but with color they kind of do so here's one early early morning um, here's another one early early morning that just if this was a blue sky this this gets deleted but with this color contrast that it's a really pink nice. cloud on the top and it's just as the sun's coming up so it's lighting up this cloud into pink and then below it is blue 
kind of a dark blue sky. And then I've got a, I actually shot a, a mammal one time in my life. So there's a <laughs> fox at sunset. Again, same thing. If this, it's, it a, it's probably one a nice time. picture. Yeah, with a blue sky. Um, it would be a nice picture, but with this gradiated, like almost sunset, this I think the sun might have even been down. down. Yeah. Um, it just makes it a much different picture. And then one more just to show you kind of a, a different it. effect. This is a peregrine falcon flying, again, a silhouette, but some things you can do with different colors. So any of these early morning, late, you know, sunset, yeah. sunrise pictures, you tend to get these crazy different colors. Just give it a shot. You may not think you have something. Um, this peregrine wasn't real close, so it's not a, clearly it's not a shot of a, a bird like a you know portrait would be. But yeah, it's it, it, to me, it works. Yeah, 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 it's different. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is that all you had there? Yep. And I think okay. do, do we have a couple seasonal shots before we wrap up? Yeah, I have a couple more creative things to hit real quick. Okay. Um, cool. Close up double crested cormorant. I specifically moved to get uh, this was filtered sunlight coming through trees. So again, just trying to get an interesting background there. Um, Again, shooting backlit. Uh, if you follow me closely, you know I like to do that. Um, so here's a wood duck, and there were just some, again, bubbles in the water in the background, making a really interesting background. Um, this one, I really thought this shot through, and I was really happy when it kind of worked out this way. So again, I saw these bubbles sitting on this calm pond in the morning, way in the background. Um, I was originally shooting off to the left a lot more, a little bit more of a side light. Uh, but then when I realized that was back there and the sun got too harsh to do anything other than straight backlight, I went into almost kind of a silhouette with this tree swallow. And uh, it just kept hitting this perch over and over again. There was actually a nest box off camera here. Um, and when I just positioned this in the, in the background, um, these bubbles, they just kind of lit up and made like a really interesting background. And if you'll notice these kind of lines going through here that look like kind of like some grasses and stuff like that, those were actually... Uh, like Phragmite reeds in the foreground that blocked the light that was hitting it. So you kind of got almost, uh, I want to say like a shadow of these grasses in the bokeh that was actually really far away in the background. So uh, kind of a combination of, again, foreground and background making something really interesting there. Uh, I already talked about that one. And yeah, let's talk about um, just some seasonal stuff. So uh, spring it's all about the colors you know uh, blossoming flowers uh, bright vivid greens of fresh new growth uh, here I got a blue gray net catcher on a cherry blossom tree and uh, you know it's just all about these bright vivid pinks and uh, showing things that pop Scott has a lovely goldfinch here in spring yeah and it's uh, exactly what Ray said when you're shooting in spring I would say just look for look for that new growth in the colors um, I, I saw a lot of great images this past year um, one of my favorite pictures was, I'm not going to forget, I was going to say Mark's. Um, he had one on a red bud that I just, I yes, like absolutely love. Yeah. But you get these really cool like purples and pinks. Um, so take advantage of it. You Sometimes you only have like a week where those colors are changing um, and some of those buds are just starting to form. So um, in this case, it's just an American goldfinch I was driving by. I would have never shot this bird had it not been that I was looking behind it and saying, wow, I think that background would look really cool. So I gave it a shot and then I got home and I said, you know what, it, it kind of works for me. So, Yeah, perfect. Um, hit, moving on to summer, uh, here's a blue winged teal. I actually shot this down in Florida. So, you know, perpetual summer down there, always bright greens. Uh, and that's kind of usually, at least in seasonal areas, that's kind of what stands out, you know, incorporating a lot of greens and uh th those bright rich colors like that um there we go scott has a a lovely tanager in that bright green yep it's all about green so everything's green and just take advantage of it the one thing i will say and we've said it before a couple times if you're shooting songbirds the the greens will look really good overcast um if you have a lens where your minimum aperture is 6.3 shooting overcast could be tough if you've got a, a lens where you can get down to f4, you're in really good shape, especially if you have a body that can handle a little bit of noise because you are going to be shooting higher ISOs. But um, utilize the greens. They're going to look great overcast. And again, here and, and your birds are going to be in breeding plumage for the most part, all your songbirds. So you get a bright red tanager on a really nice green background. And those are super combinations of, uh, of color. So that one really worked for me. Uh, we had a nice, uh, great question in the comments. He, uh, he asked, any tips about the balance of beautiful backgrounds, but the subject still being the hero of the frame rather than the background overpowering the subject and, uh, you know, taking, stealing the viewer's focus? Um, 
I don't really have any specific tips on that other than to say experiment, you know, uh, find out where that balance is. Um, you know, I've had people uh, comment on photos. Uh, here's one, an example that I was just getting ready to show for fall colors here. Um, the background is so bright and vivid in this wood duck photo, it almost overpowers it. Um, but, uh, you know, I've had people comment and say they thought the background did overpower an image, whereas I thought it didn't. Um, so, you know, I think it's a little bit taste um, and, you know, just a lot of experimentation, kind of finding out where that line is. There, I, I agree that it certainly can happen where the background becomes the star of the photo. Uh, and sometimes that maybe isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can be a, a, a cool photograph of a scene with wildlife in it instead of a wildlife photo with a cool background. So it maybe just kind of changes the perspective of it. Uh, so hopping back to our seasonal stuff here, autumn, again, we're back to colors again, just kind of like spring. So, you know, oranges, reds, yellows. Um, I had this wood duck that landed on this pond and just got some nice yellows and reds uh, in the backgrounds there. And uh, Scott's got a nice raven photo. Yeah, somebody just actually asked a question. So it said, if the bird is showy, the background is simpler. Um, and in, I'm going to show you the opposite. So yes, I, I do like that concept sometimes, a showy bird with a simple background. That's a great point. Or a yeah, pattern. Sure. Yeah, a, a patterned bird. Um, I had a black and white warbler early, so obviously monochromatic, a lot of patterns, solid green background. I think that really works. In this case, you've got a, a black bird. This is a common raven against fall colors and that's why i really like this i posted this and i don't think a lot of people really loved it but for me it was really cool to take a black bird and put it up against strong fall colors so um yes i think that kind of speaks to your point susan it can go either way yeah perfect uh, and then yeah i got uh, one more got i got one a more couple fall? more okay yeah, i'll do it. i'll do a couple more fall this is a, a one that i took this past Ooh, fall nice. again you just see these really strong fall colors in the background oranges and yellows uh, I think, and then I took, this is, um, <laughs> this is one erase. So this is, uh, yeah, same pond. I've been jealous of this background for two years. <laughs> and so I finally decided I was going to get it this year. I missed it a couple times, but he's got, uh, you know, a, a nice setup. These trees really work. This, there's some reds in the background. Yep. This was the last red tree left. Yeah. And you could see that that was the last, it was just, we were hanging on to fall yep. and it was actually winter here. So I um, was able to get this. And again, it speaks to what Susan had just mentioned. I love taking black and white subjects like this hooded merganser and throwing up against strong color. I think it's, it's really, really sharp when you do that. Yeah, very much agree. Um, cool. Hey, there you go. You want to hit that one? Is that, uh, is that more of a winter uh, image? Yeah, I was just gonna. I'll jump into winter quick, and then yeah, you could finish it. with winter. Yep. Yeah. So with with winter, you're into browns, like these deep earth tones. Um, so again, think about that. This is this is a contrast of a really kind of a vivid bird up against a really muted background. I love these um, these browns that look like leathery and worn. So I like these winter backgrounds. Sometimes they can get old when you're shooting a lot of them. So with waterfowl, you're gonna get a lot of this. Um, in the winter, you may have different, you know, I shoot more raptors and stuff in the winter, so you'll get some snow, and I think Ray's got an example where you can utilize like snow in your backgrounds to make a pretty pretty cool image. Yep, all right, so um, a snowy owl, I was actually with um, Scott, Mark, and my, our, friend, our good friend uh, Karam on this one. Um, so snowy owl, it just started snowing this day, and the snowy owl landed on this branch. So this was definitely a foreground background one. Uh, there was not a lot of choices with our background. It was kind of just, you know, white out there. Um, there was some dune options, but the angle that we were at, we really didn't have much of a choice for background. So that was kind of, uh, it, it was what it was, but there was an option for foreground. So I actually dipped really low just to get the foreground to kind of hide some of this perch. Um, so here, I'll show you another photo right before I dipped low. Uh, this one isn't fully processed, but this was the perch that the bird was on. So it's kind of a cool perch, and I actually like it. So I did include it in some of them, but I thought it was maybe, as uh, was pointed out earlier, or Susan had mentioned, things that can be overpowering. So I thought it was a little overpowering, so I decided to dip down, and when I did that, I was able to create this image, which I actually thought was a little bit more powerful uh, and something that I, uh, one of my favorite from that day, um, just kind of like an ethereal look, you know, there's just like the indication of this perch and the log kind of coming out of a soft out of focus, 
something and then just you know the bird in a sea of white with like a dark stormy sky in the background so uh that's something i really love there and then uh, did you have you, you didn't have any others right scott no that was it that was my last one all right cool so uh thank you so much everybody uh, i know we went long again we can't help ourselves we like to talk uh but thank you everybody who hung in there this long um, thank you everyone for all the comments. It's been really great. Uh, you guys were really good with comments and questions and answers and everything. Um, let's see, just, I'm just scanning right now just to make sure there's no other last minute questions here. Uh, Sandy mentions that she tends to center her subject and not much of a foreground. She can't wait to, she can't wait to apply some of these ideas. That's awesome. Uh, Zafir, um, just thanking, he said he was, uh, learning some new ways to shoot. So that's perfect. Uh, so yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I I have uh, some few things coming up in the next couple of weeks, so it's probably going to be another bit of a big break before we do another one of these. But there's definitely going to be more videos coming, so stay tuned. And uh, you know, thanks Scott again for joining. Always. And um, thank you guys. You have a great night, and uh, we'll see you the next time around. Yep. See you guys. If you have any topics or, or anything, just email or send them to Ray on the comments, you know, in his Facebook live, you can put them there or on the YouTube video. Um, he posts that later. So just, uh, yeah, shoot comments with ideas, anything you guys want to hear about. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. See you guys.